which is his first novel. Um, and we're going to try and keep this a very informal session. Um, and although I've got a few questions jotted down on this piece of paper, you are more than welcome to ask questions at any point um, about the book or about his writing life or indeed about anything that you think is relevant. <laughs> um, my name is Sharon Baca. Just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Sharon Baca, and I. Um, I'm a sort of literary busybody, I suppose, which is why I'm, why I'm here. And um, I was a blogger, I, I'm sometimes reviewer and, and uh, creative writing teacher from time to time as well. Um, for those of you who don't know Tan Chuan um, I, I think this is uh, something that Malaysians should be very proud of. We finally have authors who are getting recognized on the world stage and Twaneng's books are both published in the UK. The first novel, The Gift of Rain, was long listed for the Booker Prize. Um, and as you know, the Booker Prize is almost like the holy grail for fiction writers writing in the English language if they happen to be outside the United States. Um, and so it's pretty incredible to have uh, a Malaysian writer actually listed for the Booker Prize. And it's something that we should be very proud of. Um, Twining, um was born in Penang. Um, I, I try, I'm trying to remember all the details of his uh, autobiography, but um, sorry, I'm his bio data. Um, he's actually living now in South Africa for part of the time, and he comes back here to visit quite often. And so we're, we're very happy and very lucky to, to have him here. Something you wrote actually managed to make it um, so, so far. My first book, of course, every yeah, beginning yeah, author yeah. wants his book to be a success, and that's what we write for. And it was quite a shock to get uh, nominated for the Booker Prize, but what, what has been more surprising for me actually is um, the fact that the Americans seem to like it, which I wasn't expecting at all. Because <clears throat> when the American publisher approached my agent to buy the rights, I just thought, mm -hmm. <clears throat> nobody's going to appreciate it or understand or even know where Malaysia is, first of all. But to my surprise, uh, it's done, of all the territories around the world, it's done the best in the US, I think. I quite agree with, with him. Uh, you know, <clears throat> when people say, oh, the first novel took you a very short while to write, which is actually a lie because I was about in my 30s when I wrote the first novel, so actually the first novel took 20 years to produce because it was the, uh, the culmination of everything I've ever read and been interested in and wanted to talk about. And actually the second novel, which people complained that I took a hell of a long time over, actually was a much shorter time, three years. Uh, the problem with writing the second novel is, in my case, because the first one did reasonably well, and with the, with the, when you write the first novel, you, you give everything that you have. You basically dry the well. And there's nothing left for the second novel. Uh, it doesn't. Because, and what's worse is that every book, I, I'm starting to suspect now, every book will get harder and harder to write. And it's not something that I'm looking forward to because I, I thought it would get easier and easier. You, know? you sort of... I mean, I was a lawyer before, so you know, in subsequent cases, you can sort of coast. You've got the precedents, the law, everything in the computer system, you just bring it out and cut and paste. Uh, and it gets easier, I would say, but <clears throat> with writing, uh, to my horror, uh, to my growing horror, I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and harder and harder and harder. Well, again, it's, uh, it's, it's gotten harder because when I write something pretty and then I say, oh, have I used it for the first book? <laughs> I have to look through the first one. Thank goodness I write on the laptop because then I can open up the uh, manuscript of the first one and do a word search and say, oh, did I use this before? You know, because sometimes you, you forget. And there were two or three occasions when, yes, I had used the description before and uh, I was very glad that I caught it. Uh, <clears throat> coming up with new ways of saying things, that was, that was one of the hardest things about writing the book as well. Uh, to say something new, to say something in a new and original way without resorting to cliches, that was very hard. Well, um, it came from 
when I actually met a person who was the gardener of the Emperor of Japan, I met him in uh, Johannesburg on a, just a social occasion and I spoke to him for <coughs> not a long time because he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Japanese. <laughs> So he was just, oh, oh, oh. Said, yeah. <laughs> but <clears throat> just the uh, description of the man, it was, uh, the, the Emperor's Gardener, it, it rang a lot of bells here. And I thought, what, what can I do with someone like that? And <clears throat> it sort of grew from, from that description. Uh, I had various plot elements floating around already, and uh, the Emperor's Gardener sort of tied everything together. I thought, okay, it can work, but you ask why why a garden? Well, <clears throat> because <clears throat> I've become more interested in, in nature and gardening over the years. And I had I realized that for a Japanese garden setting to work, it would have to be in a cool climate. So there were just two choices for me, it's either Cameron Highlands or Fraser's Hill. <laughs> uh, there were no Gunting Highlands then, so <laughs> And Fraser's Hill was kind of dead in the 50s, so I thought, okay, uh, Cameron Highlands, because people were starting to, uh, to, to, to build up the tea plantations around the time in the 50s. And I've always been interested in the, uh, the myth of Jim Thompson as well. So I thought, <coughs> let's see what I can work with and bring everything together into this. this. It's, it's very difficult, yes, to, to write from a perspective of a woman because uh, I didn't want the character to be a woman in the first place, but because I thought it's difficult to write a woman about a woman character in the 50s because, and the 40s as well, because they did not have as much liberty to move around society as a male character would have. You know? If I wrote a, a male character, I, I can easily have him going anywhere he wants to at any time. But with a female character, you have to think, okay, would she have been allowed out on her own? Would she have been uh, able to do this or that? Yeah. But there were a lot of uh, restrictions. And also the... Uh, every little thing that... Um, writing about a woman character from a... As a, as a, as a male writer, like the way she sat... Uh, what's in her handbag... I had to spend the day thinking, okay, this is a woman and what is in her handbag? And I couldn't think of anything, girl. What's in the handbag? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't intend it to be part of the movie because um, that was the backstory. I needed a backstory for the, one of the characters who is a Japanese art historian. And I was racking my brains to, to think of something to, interesting to, to give him, to make him come alive. And after one day, I just realized I had, I had the backstory already. All I had to do was, as with my first novel, I took an existing story and then I put it in there and then I make, made sure the uh, stitches were not showing. <laughs> changed the names. I changed the. Uh, I also toned down the, the, the uh, description as well. If you, if, yes, if you read I them, have, the, yes. I haven't gone back to the original. If you compare the two, I toned down a lot. It's become more dry and. <laughs> I thought it was more powerful. Yeah, it's, it's simpler, but powerful. the story is just uh, less descriptive. So, yeah. um, so a tip for all of you writers is that <clears throat> don't ever delete anything you've written. <laughs> just cut it out and save it somewhere because with the computer it's so easy. You, you never know when you're desperate enough. Right? <laughs> and like the first one, you know, the moment I had a 7,000 word short story squeezed in there. I, I can sort of relax for a few days, you know. All my word quota is done for the week. Um, but I considered a long time whether to put it in there. Because it's, it's already been read. It's yeah. been out there. Yeah. But not by many people. Not by many people. So so that I'm the same really happy. Yeah. 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 I, I personally feel story is the main thing in writing or reading a book because you, you might have a lot of important things to say, but you really have to capture the reader's attention and the, the one way is to do that through the story. And without the story, it becomes, I think, very... Uh, uh, it's difficult for the reader to, to, to continue to tell.
turn the pages. And this is what I think is so good. That, yes. Yeah, yes. So the story is, is, is the primary vehicle, I think. And um, I feel that there's starting to have a swing back to that uh, in terms of uh, literature from around the world. There are more, there are more, uh, they're giving more uh, <coughs> importance to the story now. I think so. Examples. Well, I hope so. Examples. Well, uh, if you look at The Tiger's Wife, it's very story driven. So that's that's the only one. Isn't it already? And I think people people are getting tired of, of too much uh, self indulgence from writers. They do want a good story because what what you remember from a book five years from now, you remember that it used a lot of funny text and the way it was printed, and, or do you remember the characters and the story and what they went through and how they overcame the platform? I, for me personally, that I think the story is what makes it matter. First of all, you don't know whether you're going to have an opportunity to write a second one. <laughs> so you, you, you give it everything you have. That's you just generous. throw everything, the kitchen sink, the cabinets, the taps, everything you put it in there. Uh, and then, then you realize, oh shit, I have to write a second novel. <laughs> But uh, I have no regrets uh, throwing everything in there. I, I understand, yes, there are a lot of things I could have done. Yeah, yeah. 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 Put it for another novel, but... Will be able to use them in the future? Yes, yeah, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But <laughs> when, you, when you're running a race, you give everything you have. Yeah. <laughs> you can't say, I'll save some energy for the next race. Why not be in a I'm always interested in the older person's view, new points. It's, I think it's more interesting for the reader as well because you get to see this person, age 65, looking back at the mistakes she did, she's done, and now trying to uh, sort of make up for what she, the wrongs that she's done. So it's, you get to compare the character when, when she's young and when she's older, and I think it's, uh, it makes a more interesting read. Because this is a, this isn't a big as big a novel as *The Gift of Rain*, so it has to. It doesn't have the scope of letting the reader understand you think from 14 to 65. So it has to start when she's at the end of her life, and she has to make certain decisions about where she wants to go from there. So when you have uh, a character looking back, it it makes I think the reader think as well. I personally like books with flashbacks, so I write what I want to read. <laughs> All the bits of things that you've written over a period of years, how do you file them? How do you, how do you organize them so they're usable? Each person will have their own system. You know, so uh, for me, I, I'm very meticulous about where I put them, so and I name them properly in my computer, so I know instantly where to look for them. And I have a reasonably good memory, so even if I'm don't know where exactly the piece is, I will sort of know where to look for. But it, I think you have to be organized when it comes to work. Uh, <clears throat> and writing is work. A lot of people think it's not, it's just a hobby or something, but you have to really treat it as a profession as well. And I think this is where the fact that I was a lawyer before helped, because we had to be really well organized with our documentation and things like that. And the, 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 the bad habit, I suppose, sort of passed over to my writing mind. And I'm quite a control freak in many ways, so I, I need things to be where I know they will be. So your system, you, it's up to you, really, how you want to organize it. Do you still practice law? Okay, because um, is there a difference, say, to your writing now when you're not practicing what you're really training as to when you were full time in law? Or does being a lawyer influence the way you write or your approach to it? Ways I, I would say yes because I'm, I give a lot of value to uh, clarity. Clarity. 
I want my writing to be clear. I want my writing to be, you know, when you read it, you don't have to read it three times to understand what it means. Because it usually drives me crazy when I read writers and what are you trying to say? Yes. If you, if you as a writer don't even put in the effort to be clear, you're really uh, <coughs> cheating your reader because that's your job to convey your message as clearly as possible. And if you fudge it around and you think, oh, I'm being artistic, then it, for me that doesn't work because it has to be clear. It has to be really, you, know, you read it the first time, you understand precisely what I mean. There might be two or three meanings, but you will see the double or triple meanings as well. You're not going to be saying that. In South Africa, or both? Both my books were written in South Africa. Oh, really? Yes. And how do you think that would have affected you, looking back? and not living in the place that you're... Mm. I mean, I have to admit, it's ignorant here. I came because I thought this looked an interesting Good. afternoon. <laughs> but I, I have to admit, I have not read either of your books. Yes. 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 Oh, but That's I, the important word, is yet. And uh, I'm living here at the moment, so I thought it was a, a good... And I know about Jim Thompson. And, you know, I, we, we, I know this place, this lovely country. So I'm interested in, in these books. But if you had moved to South Africa, how did that affect your writing, looking back? I mean, because sometimes I say to my husband, remember so and so and so and so. But then it's not what I remember, and he'll say it's something else. So you don't always have the same recollections. I understand they're novels and not autobiographical, but I'm sure there must be. Well, I think with, with the gift of rain, um, the, uh, the sense of uh, nostalgia is stronger because I was away. Uh, the sense Why did you move away? When did I move? When I was very young. Ah, okay. I've been back uh, <clears throat> almost every year. Right. Uh, I would say the, the, the sense of nostalgia is, uh, is, is strong, strong in the first book because I was missing the place. Yeah. I wanted to convey that sense of nostalgia to the reader as well. So I think it's it relevant to the story. Yes, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a book about nostalgia as well, anyway. I take the good ones well and the bad yeah. ones badly. <laughs> <laughs> I know how he takes the bad ones, just emails me. Uh, <laughs> you don't read them, don't read them. I do. I do. <laughs> Come on, everybody reads it. Every writer will read it. Uh, as long as they're fair, I think I can take the, the bad ones as well. And I've got some really bad ones as well. Well, I think you laugh at them. I laugh I, at them. I, I, I do, do I laugh at them. I think you take it with a sense of, a good sense of humor, yeah. you know. Uh, it's interesting to see people's viewpoints and, and sometimes they, they just completely miss the whole point of it. And, uh, and, but I have a, a, a policy that I don't reply, I don't leave comments anymore. I think it's you, you're setting up, setting up on a on a losing battle if you try to engage somebody. So it's just anyway. I suppose it's part of the job. So I have to accept it. If they, if the criticism say, oh, this you know, it's full of cliches, the plot is like a soap opera, then I would say, yeah, okay, let me look at it and see if the person has a, has a point. But if Sometimes some of the reviews are quite bitchy as well for no reason. <laughs> so you just ignore it and say, oh, job. There's nothing you can do. I've learned you just can't. You know, somebody will like it and then somebody say, oh, this is one of the worst books I've ever read. You know, I don't know. And you just, there's nothing you can do. That's part of being readers, really, isn't it? You know, um, there, there, there would be no fun in, in reading and discussing books if everybody had the same. Yeah point of view and, and I, if you I, couldn't I, argue about I it. I have the same point of view as well. Some books people love and I say that's one of the worst books I've yeah, ever read. You know? Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Argue about, about this. I understand where the readers are coming from. I use a lot of uh, contemporary accounts, but also photographs. A lot of photographs. Because uh, it's that that was a period when you know, people started taking a lot of photographs after the war. So there, there's a lot of material there for you for me to look at. Uh, the description of the checkpoints and things yes, like that. Yes, yes. That those those yeah. were all from photographs. Wow. Um, I actually cut, the, cut out a lot of research because my first readers, people I trusted, said, oh, this is actually very boring because you just put too many things in there. Uh, 
because I was horribly insulted that he had no taste at all. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it's one of the toughest jobs being a writer is I think deciding how much research you want to put inside. I still feel that it could have done more with a lot more. I wouldn't uh, mind. Yeah, it. I wouldn't I mind it, it, but um, for me, it was one of the yeah. parts. Yes, but some of my readers, the first readers, they, they just they so bored reading it. <laughs> some. Yeah, some. Some. Are we in deep psychological no, territory? Well, the, well, the first one, yes, is a mental mental relationship. But I, with the second one, I will feel less because you think it's more of an equal. She's much stronger, much older, and she's. I have to say, she's not a pleasant character. Don't you like her? Well, why don't you like your own character? It was it was difficult writing her, you know, uh, and I realized why only after I finished writing because. With the first book, uh, the main character, Philip, was, in, was 16, 17, and you know, he's got this wide-eyed, gosh, gee, approach to life. So it was very easy to write him because he was open to experiences and to expressing himself. Now with, with Tio Yun Ling, because of what she had gone through, um, to me, and this sounds very wanky and pretentious, but to me, she was locking everything she wouldn't let me in. I just couldn't get a hold of her. I just couldn't get who she was for a very, very long time until almost near the end of the book when everything cracked open and then I had to go back again and build her up again. Which point was it where you found you knew her? Um, after she told, uh, after she related what happened to her in the camp. Yeah, yeah that, that okay. was when yeah. I realized who she was. But before that, it was, it was really, really, uh, difficult for me to understand who she is and it came through in the first draft because uh, again my first readers read the first draft and they said this character is dead there's no life to her so uh, now back to your question of the mental mentee the second book i feel isn't as much as the mental mentee uh, uh, the first one yes and with the uh, <coughs> short story of the tatsuji one that is so yes, not so much as well. These are more to be writers. <laughs> I basically treat it as a, as a job. Uh, I wake up, I go to the gym in the morning as early as I can, come back, quickly shower, rush through my breakfast, sit down, and I never ever work in my pajamas. I shower, I shave, I put on a shirt and trousers, and I sit at my desk. Yeah, because I, you know, if, you, if you go around the whole day in your pajamas, there's a sort of a, <laughs> you, you become sort of very uh, sloppy, and then your thinking becomes sloppy as well. So everything is geared towards uh, treating it as a job, really. Uh, but I take a lot of breaks, and the horrible thing is Wi-Fi, which is very bad. You know, every half an hour, like, oh, let's see who sent me an email. <laughs> Uh, it's very bad. I, there were times when I actually switched off the main plug of the Wi-Fi. Of course, that lasts for an hour and then I could be run back. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, each person will have their own habit, so I can't dictate to you what... Uh, if it works for you, it works for you. I, I know some writers who actually lie in bed and then type four or five sentences and then they walk around and then they come back. So, but I, I can't do that. It's, uh, Work. It depends. I usually try to work from 9 to 5 with a lot of breaks in there. Uh, if it's really going well, I usually work until 7 at night. Uh, but I have a rule that I don't work after dinner because I, I want to read. I want to read books. I want to do something else. Every day? Almost when I'm here. Yeah. Uh, but the thing with, with working at home is that People think you're free all the time, and then they start <laughs> dropping in. And, and I find it very uh, inconsiderate of a lot of my friends. You know, some of them are visiting from other towns, and then they ring up and say, Oh, we're in town. You, you wouldn't think of disturbing somebody's office when you come to town. But you know, for a lot of people, they just assume that, Oh, you're at home, so he's probably, you know, just doing nothing and watching TV. I think it's like that if you're a freelancer anyway. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> I've embarrassed him now, isn't that good? <laughs>
Well, as, as, you, as you said, because A, write, writing a sex scene is very, very hard. Uh, if, you, if you don't do it well, it becomes very laughable. <laughs> like the act itself. Uh, and I always skip the sex scenes in books. Because it's like... Uh, so when I'm writing, I, I, I have no interest in write, describing something as well. Unless it's really, really relevant to it. And most of the time it's not. You just, you, you're more interested in showing the effect two characters, what, what happens after they have sex, you know, whether they smoke a cigarette or they do it again, but uh, I think reading, reading sex scenes is very boring and tedious, unless you're reading it for the, for the salacious uh, aspects, but to, to have a, a sex scene in a, in a book, I feel a lot of times it's, uh, it's slowing down the, the, the plot, it's, it's um, even, even a notorious book like Lolita, which is all about sex, there is actually no sex scene in there. Really? The sexist bit's the apple, eating the apple. That's not sexy. I know. There's no, there's no penetration. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think it's necessary to, uh, to, to, to put a sex scene in. But I'm more interested in showing the, uh, the consequences of what happens after. 